Coming up on DTNS, what Germany thinks is the most secure browser. Do you need to worry about your VPN provider getting hacked and artificial skin for your phone? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 21st, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just having a very productive discussion of the metric system and its uses uh, on our Good Day Internet show. If you'd like to get that and more in our expanded show, uh, why not become a Patreon? Uh, Patreon.com slash DTNS gets you that and more. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. A Huawei executive told Reuters on Friday that the company is in early stage talks with U.S. telecoms about licensing Huawei's 5G technology. The company's senior vice president, Vincent Pang, said that telcos had expressed interest in both a long-term deal or a one-off transfer. Google says that in the coming months, it will issue a software update for the Pixel 4 phones that will give users the option to require eyes to be unopened to unlock the Pixel 4 with your face. In the meantime, if Pixel 4 users are concerned about somebody unlocking their phone, you know, by pointing at them while they're asleep or unconscious, they can long press the power button and choose the lockdown option that would require a pin or a pattern or a password the next time the phone is unlocked. Microsoft is acquiring cloud file migration provider Mover for an undisclosed amount. Microsoft executives said that the goal is to help customers migrate to Microsoft 365 plus Windows, Office 365, and Intune bundles. Other Microsoft tools for cloud migration include FastTrack and the SharePoint migration tool. So they've got some already there, but Mover supports migration from cloud services providers like Box, Dropbox, Ignite, and Google Drive. As long as Mover doesn't stop letting me go from um, Dropbox to box, et cetera, then that's fine. A test from YouTube channel PhoneBuff uh, indicates you might get more battery life out of your iPhone with an OLED screen if you turn on dark mode. OLED screens can turn pixels off, unlike LCD screens, so there's a bigger difference there. PhoneBuff compared two iPhone XS Maxes running iOS 13. Uh, they had an automation to do activities like watch YouTube, Twitter, and Maps identically on both phones. Did it? Uh, they set up the test for two hours at 200 nits of brightness. The phone using dark mode still had 30% of its battery life when the phone running light mode died before the two hours was up. More tests would be needed to confirm the real level of difference and eliminate alternate causes, but it seems like it does make some kind of difference. You know, I'm all about dark mode on uh, OS 10. Haven't tried it on iOS yet. Yeah, um, I, I've noticed that iOS 13 wasn't as bad on my battery life as usual iOS <laughs> updates are on my older phone. So yeah, maybe maybe that's because then I turned on dark mode. So maybe that's why. All right, let's talk a little more about NordVPN's troubles. Let's do it. NordVPN says that one of its VPN services at a data servers, rather at a data center, it was uh, renting in Finland, was accessed without authorization. The attacker exploited an insecure remote management system that NordVPN says it was unaware of, left on the server by the data center operator. NordVPN says no user logs or credentials were available on the server. The attacker could have performed a man-in-the-middle attack, though, to intercept a single connection that tried to access. NordVPN through that server. The attacker would have not would not have been able to access VPN traffic on any other server. However, TechCrunch has seen similar records indicating other providers, including uh, TorGuard and Viking VPN, may have been breached around the same time. TorGuard told TechCrunch a single server was compromised in 2017, but no VPN traffic was accessed at that time. And TorGuard did reveal that back in May. So um, uh, it, that was a previous revelation. But but, but to the NordVPN uh, situation, it's not great. Uh, there are things that that a a uh, an attacker could have gotten uh, if they knew a lot. If they knew that their target was using NordVPN and connecting through Finland and hit that server, then they could have uh, intercepted some traffic. Uh, they could have just done, you know, kind of just random sampling to see what they could find there too. That That's possible as well. Uh, I, I do believe NordVPN when they say it wasn't us, it was a remote management software we were unaware was on there, just points out the importance of uh, working with your hosting provider to make sure that there's nothing unexpected running on a server you rent. Yeah, no kidding. 
this is uh, this is something I don't think should put in question the idea of using a VPN, uh, but it does highlight the fact that when you are using a VPN, you're not default secure. You are trusting your security to the provider of your VPN. Uh, so it's it's good that NordVPN found this. It's good that it's been fixed. Uh, but but yeah, it, it's not like VPN is a is a magic bullet that that protects you all the time. Right, especially when you like Google in free VPN server. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> when you're on vacation, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good idea. Or, or do it with caution, extreme caution. Uh, Roger, you were pointing out that the, the actually the most secure VPN or is probably to run it yourself, although you would not necessarily be more secure. You'd just have only yourself to blame. Uh, yeah, I mean, I run OpenVPN server off my router, and I only use it when I'm traveling like Sarah, so... Mm -hmm. Um, I've never had any issues with it, and it works pretty well. But if you have any security lapses, I mean, it's really just on your shoulders. Yeah. Twitch is testing something called watch parties. Here we go again. Uh, it would allow streamers on Twitch to screen Amazon Prime Video content, some Amazon Prime Video content, to viewers of Twitch, provided that the viewer also has an Amazon Prime subscription. Uh, the feature is currently in testing for select streamers invited by Twitch. We've seen so many versions of this over the past decade where YouTube, Xbox, uh, Blu-ray all said, uh, we're going to let you watch movies with your friends over the internet at the same time, and none mm -hmm. of them have caught on. Sarah, do you think this one could be any different? Well, I don't think that the concept is really that different, but, but, I, but I have always liked the concept. The concept of... Okay, we're in a uh, um, a world where it's everything's on demand, and we no one's watching things at the same time. I mean, most things at this point. Some things are still live, but uh, but the idea that you can kind of like get some camaraderie by all getting together and watching something uh, in unison and chatting about it. There have been many apps and services. I mean, Twitter had its own version of this that never really got off the ground. Uh, I can't even remember the one that uh, was the idea of like checking into a show when when mm -hmm. you would be watching it back in the day. It's Facebook not a, Watch has a system that does this, Facebook but only Watch with Facebook is, Watch video. Yeah, but it, you know, it's sort of like, okay, well, if, if a Twitch uh, user, content creator, has enough uh, folks that are interested in watching something, you know, they promote it ahead of time, and then it's sort of this fun thing where you all sort of sit back and not unlike watching somebody play a video game, I guess. Yeah. And then you got your chat going, and it's you know it's kind of lively. That sounds fun to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously you have to care about the content, I suppose, but I. I I think Twitch is they they will be as successful as this uh, at this than probably any other platform I can think of right now. Yes. Oh no, I was about to say like <laughs> um, you know it's inter very interesting that uh, on the on the Polygon article that that they posted the story they use uh, an image of uh, the movie. Um, oh, criminy. Um, Johnny Dangerously. Jo Johnny Dangerously. Yeah. And this is where I think this will be the most benefit is if you can do something sort of like a mystery science 33,000 where someone is watching a movie that people have already seen, but then adds the commentary, the unique take on it. It adds uh -huh. a lot more because you're, you, you don't need to have people like, well, I've never seen this before. It's all brand new to me. You pick, you pick cult movies, you pick movies that are already seen. Um, it, it could be a veritable gold mine of content. As the well, people and who have done MST3K will tell you though, not everyone can do what they do. It may look easy, uh, but it took a lot of work to make that come off. So I, I think it's smart for Twitch to target this as streamers, though, because even if it's not an MST3K thing, just saying, oh, I'm going to watch a movie or a TV show with this person that I enjoy watching on Twitch is more compelling. There's already a Diamond Club uh, watch along that happens sort of ad hoc where they all just have to press play at the same time uh, and watch along with each other. This makes that easier. So, so having it be community oriented and personality led, I think is if this is going to catch on the thing that would make it work. Although I, I think, you know, Roger's point of the idea of having commentary from one of your favorite creators be somehow part of this is what, not everybody's going to be able to do this with success. Like you said, Tom, you can't just like be like, oh, you know, we're going to like provide commentary and it's going to be great. But some people will do that quite well. Yeah, And I, th sure. I think that if, you know, with Amazon's library thinking, 
do we give this movie a second life by, you know, offering this kind of, uh, you know, another layer on top of it is really smart. And so many people are more likely to have Amazon Prime Video because they already pay for free shipping mm. or they want to pay for Twitch Prime because they're on Twitch. Uh, so so I think it it has fewer of those roadblocks of like, yeah, but I don't have that service and I don't want to sign up for it. Yeah, I want to talk about human skin on phones. Oh, my. Yes, I yes. guess. Yes. I mean, you have to say yes, because we're going to do it. Scientists at the University of Bristol and Sorbonne University have developed a skin-like inputs interface for use with phones and also computers. So a multi-layer silicone membrane has a textured surface, electrode layer, and also a hypodermis. It can differentiate actions like tickling or caressing or twisting, even pinching. The scientists created a phone case, computer touchpad, and also a smartwatch for demonstrations. For instance, with the phone touches and grip strength were interpreted as different emotions, expressed as emojis such as surprise, laughter, or anger. The scientists are ready to work with developers and want to research adding things like hair and temperature. Just a disclaimer right now. We already know what a lot of you are thinking this is going to be used for, and we'll just leave that to your imaginations. Yep, uh, yep. That's, that's you know, that's that's on you. That's but for the non-adult uh, oriented uses <laughs> of this, uh, I, I think that, that if you get past the creepy factor, like, let's just say, like, right now, this is going to catch on if it doesn't look like skin That's for, right. for, for most cases. Like, if it's like, oh, we have this new interface that that you can, like, grip your phone to provide interface or or have more delicate touch interactions. We already have force touch, long press, things like that. Uh, if, if you could have a wider vocabulary of touch interactions, not just for a phone, but for a computer as well, I think that could be put to a lot of interesting uses. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why would I ever want to tickle a smart device? <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's like, I think, again, this is it, it sort of goes back to a conversation we were having on the show last week. It's like, this is one of those things where you're like, well, why would I ever want to do that? But the once you have it, you're like, oh, remember when we just had to like, press a button and that was the only option that we had and maybe like force touch like made it a little bit cooler uh when you watch the demo video of this in action it's very skin silly putty looking oh my and, gosh, yeah, you so know creepy. and and somewhat off-putting you know you're kind of like oh why would anybody want this but just the idea of the 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 you know the next evolution of haptic feedback being something that is smart enough to discern between these things based on your mood as a human is really cool yeah imagine the video game uh, interactions or or just e even things like video editing uh or or cad yeah. design where you you just want to have a more precise uh interaction where you're like i just want to lightly brush here art uh for illustration there's all kinds mm -hmm. of things like right. if this is just a if you're a, angry, you twist it. You know, <laughs> if this let is just a dark black, uh, you know, non hairy <laughs> interface, uh, I, I think uh, I think it could get accepted uh, quite easily for sure. Yeah, I would like skin on my phone in those cases. Just put it there. Yeah, Researchers, like, uh, yeah, anyway, I was about to say no hair for me, but again. You know, I that know there might be show, need show me how it's cool. And as then, long as it doesn't you know, look hairy. I think that's the key. Yes. You might want the hair to be detecting things. But. Sure, sure. Uh, researchers at Germany's security research labs developed four Amazon Echo skills and four Google Home skills that passed through both companies' vetting processes, uh, got into the stores, and were demonstrations of the ability to uh, listen in on people without them knowing it and fish their passwords. Uh, users would trigger the apparently innocent app by saying something like, ask my lucky horoscope to give me the horoscope for Taurus. That was one of the versions of the apps was a horoscope app. Uh, the apps then gave the respect expected response and went silent. So you as a user would not necessarily uh, think anything was amiss if you're not paying close attention. But the apps were not silent. They were speaking an unpronounceable character, uh, particularly the U plus D801 dot space character, which is the question mark in a box that you see sometimes when stuff is uninterpreted. That kept the app running without making noise. Now, after these apps were reviewed, they were modified. This is the first part of the problem, which was they were vetted through the app review process, but they weren't vetted after modifications. The modifications added things like the stop command would no longer stop the app, 
but was programmed to say goodbye but keep those invisible characters running. And further voice commands were met with more silence. So some of the apps would just record what they heard during the silence and then send a transcript to the developer. Those were for eavesdropping. Others followed a period of silence with a fake error message or an alert for a fake device update, both of which asked the user for their password. So it's a way of fishing the password out of somebody. Security Researcher Labs took down all the apps and privately reported the results to Google and Amazon. Google and Amazon, in some cases, say they took down the apps, but the apps are not there anymore. It was for research purposes. They alerted the companies about this, and both companies say they have taken steps to prevent apps from exploiting these measures in the future. Yeah, I mean, the when I first read the story this morning, I was like, oh, here we go. I knew it. It was just a matter of time. My smart speaker is, you know, fishing me. But, uh, but it sounds like everything that at least could be done with this particular method of of, mm -hmm. of spying on people and gaining information that that you, uh, a user did not explicitly say was okay has now been shut down doesn't mean there aren't others totally. and, and i'm sure there won't be i'm sure there will be rather in the future but um this is you know well altogether a, a good thing uh, things I am pleased about, or as, as Bart Bouchatz might say, a uh, fire extinguisher, are uh, that that this was caught by researchers. Uh, it was privately disclosed and fixed. Uh, this is mostly good news. Like researchers found a thing, stopped the thing from happening before it could be exploited. Uh, things that might set my hair a little on fire is, my gosh, Amazon and Google, why aren't you vetting updates? And please, could you clearly state that you're now vetting updates, which they haven't done in any of the things that I've read? Because right, that's, a, right. that's a huge and obvious way to catch these sorts of things. Uh, and then, yes, uh, further things that say, ah, these characters that don't make any sound, uh, should just be blanket uh, kept out of the ability to be spoken because they don't make any sound. That's probably a good thing too. I'd like some clarification that that has been done. Uh, they're, they're saying that they fixed this is a little bit vague for my tastes, but overall, mostly a good story. You know, it's, it's interesting how not, I mean, people get confused all the time, but we are becoming more and more savvy to what something in an app store kind of looks fishy. You know, whether it's iOS or Google Play or whatever, yeah. um, you know, or another, and you kind of go, eh, I don't know, something's something's kind of weird about this developer. You, you can do a little bit of due diligence and 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 hopefully make the right choice. But uh, like the skills, uh, Amazon uh, uh, App Store, for lack of it, whatever they call it, is you know, it's still very wild westy. My Fitbit Versa App Store, uh, mm -hmm. and there's quite a bit in there, is very wild westy. And it, it kind of just highlights how much consumers, when you have something new, you're like, oh, cool. These are cool. These are fun new things. And Let people tend to things. want, yeah, right. exactly. You, t you tend to want to, um, you know, give it a go and, ah, oh, horoscope, great. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and in many cases, it's not doing what you think it's doing. Look, none of us in this audience, obviously, would be fished by this. But there's a lot of people who don't realize, like, oh, wait, speaking my password out loud, is that weird? I, I mean, it's Amazon asking me, right? It must be right. fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I speak it out loud when I'm logging into stuff on Apple TV every now and then. Kind of feels weird, but also easier than typing. David Marcus, head of Facebook's Libra project, told a banking seminar that Libra was open to alternative approaches to its currency token, including a series of stable coins, each pegged to a specific currency, rather than a synthetic amalgamation, as Libra initially outlined. Marcus said that this isn't Libra's new preferred format method, and its ultimate goal is to create a more efficient payment system. Marcus also told Reuters that uh, June launch for Libra is still the goal, but the association will not move forward without regulatory approval. Yeah, if, you're, if your head's spinning a little bit on these stories, uh, Libra was going to peg the value of its coin to multiple currencies at once. They call it a basket of currencies to try to defend against market manipulation or fluctuations. Uh, but now they're saying like, well, if regulators don't like that because it seems like a competitive currency, we could just peg it directly to the currency in the market it operates. So in the US, it'd be pegged to the dollar. In uh, England, it would be pegged to the pound sterling. In Europe, it'd be pegged to the euro. So they're, they're starting to bend over backwards to say, Whatever gets you to let us launch, we'll do that. And if you don't want us to launch in June, great. We'll wait till you give us the go-ahead. We're willing to do whatever we want. It's just not looking good for Libra. Yeah, it really isn't. The German Federal Office for Information Security carried out an audit of browser security 
testing four browsers, Firefox 68 ESR, Google Chrome 76, Microsoft Internet Explorer 11, and Microsoft Edge 44. Now, you may notice that those tests do not include all the browsers. They do not include Safari, Brave, Opera, or Vivaldi. So if you use or promote Safari, Brave, Opera, or Vivaldi, you get to say, well, our browser is also great. You just didn't test it. But of the ones they did test, the audit evaluated how well the browsers complied with the office's very extensive guidelines for secure modern browsers. The, the guidelines are way too long for us to tell you here. You can find them in the ZDNet article and elsewhere. Uh, but it's things like, you know, support for TLS, icons for secure connections, signed and verifiable browser updates, user control of your browser history, user control blacklists, and it gets way more detailed and way more techy and wonky than that. Uh, this is a tough list to meet, but Firefox was the only browser that met all the requirements. Chrome, IE, and Edge, all three, failed for lack of support for a master password mechanism and no option to block telemetry collection, IE failed the most requirements, and Chrome and Edge were, were pretty much neck and neck in their failing a few. They, all, uh, the, even IE only failed like a dozen or so of the requirements. So, so they all did pretty well on what's a pretty exhaustive list, but, uh, but Firefox aced the test. So there you go. Well, congratulations, Firefox. It also it makes me chuckle a little bit. We had a discussion last Friday about uh, the idea of uh, you know cognitive bias in humans, and browsers are a great example of that. At least in my world, where I'm like, yeah, Chrome is probably not the best. Firefox seems cool, but like, I don't know. I know how Chrome works. I'm just gonna go ahead and stick with this less mm -hmm. secure version of yeah. what I could be using. Macaque monkeys are all using Firefox now. They, <laughs> well, because they're this, they switched right over. See Friday's show to understand what I'm talking about there. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's another point in Firefox's favor. If you look closely at this, yeah. it's not like Chrome and Edge did horribly. No one should be using IE 11 unless they absolutely have to these days. It's not that it's insecure by, you know, by most uh, measurements, but it's it's on its way out, and it's obviously not going to get better. I don't think so. You got Edge. If you just want to use the Microsoft default browser, just use Edge. And if you're like, but I'm on Windows XP, maybe you should think about upgrading. If you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Also, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit, whether they are stories about browsers or monkeys or skin on smartphones we'll take them submit stories and also vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com we're also on facebook we've got a great group there facebook.com slash groups slash daily tech news show all right nate langson is back with us with a preview of what's coming up in the next text message podcast including the future of retail tech stores in britain Thanks, guys. Well, this week, Tom joined me to discuss some transatlantic issues, such as whether the UK's complaining about Facebook's tax bill is justified and whether high street gadget shops are as doomed in the US as they seem to be here in Britain. So if you want to know what DTNS might sound a bit like if Tom hosted it once a week with an English guy, do check out text message at uktechshow.com and look for episode 182. Yeah, and if you're a, a, a patron of uh, Text Message, you even get a little bonus topic. Uh, that was a lot of fun. The only negative at all of doing that show with Nate uh, last week was that now I couldn't listen to it over the weekend because I was I already knew what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> Bummer. I all wrote right, let's the news again. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Komei, who uh, had a really good tip for me because I'm in the middle of moving. Anybody who's watching the video feed can sort of see things disappearing behind me and uh -huh. it, in my studio here. Uh, but uh, when it comes to boxing everything up, got a really good tip here. Before closing each moving box, take a picture of what's inside the box. Take out some stuff, lay it next to the box for the picture if you have to, so nothing's hidden. Most people will write down what's on the box, either on the box itself or maybe in a separate list, but they often forget to note small little things like that stapler, or that you know, spare battery box that's under some stuff. After you moved, you get overwhelmed by the stack of boxes. Rather through going all the box, through going through all the boxes looking for something, you end up ordering a new one from Amazon One Day Delivery. Kome, you're absolutely right. And this is a great tip. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a few boxes in now, but I've got quite a few more to go. And I'm absolutely going to use this technique. 
I was originally thinking when I read Komei's email, like, ooh, and then you could get like one of those little wireless photo printers that print stickers, and you could actually print the photo and stick it to the box, and then you, which is probably way too much work for somebody who's packing. Right. But buy things to move. <laughs> but then you could, but you could just like put a number. I was thinking you put a number on the box and make sure that number's visible. Maybe you write it on the inside flap of the top of the box when you take the picture. And then you could just be like, okay, look through my phone, find, oh, there's the stapler. It's in box six. You can go find box six. Exactly. You know, there's no yeah. foolproof way, but this is pretty genius. When I when I moved last time, um, I had gifted some really nice speakers that had real nice cables. And, you know, I had the whole thing um, to a friend of mine. But the 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 cables that would go into a receiver kind of went missing when I moved. And I was like, let me just move and I'll find them and then I'll, you know, I'll mail them to you. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. It took me a while. And you know why? Because I put them in a box that I had labeled Sonos. <laughs> because at <laughs> the time, totally I was, sense at the time, right? Right. Cause I was like AV stuff. Yeah. But just put it all in there. But I just kind of like, didn't really get around to like putting together my Sonos situation, you know, for like a month after I lived here. And, you know, he kept saying like, you know, you, you still got those cables. And I was like, I don't know, somewhere. I hope Probably. so. Yeah. I had them. Yeah. They were just mismarked. So that that would have helped me a lot. To Kobe's point, I've definitely had the experience where I move and as I'm packing, find the thing that I couldn't find the last time I moved. Right. Like yeah. the entire time I lived in a place had thought I had lost this thing. And like you say, probably replaced it. Uh, and then you move and you're like, Oh, that's where that was. Uh, the lens cap for the camera I used to shoot my Tech Republic top five videos, for instance, uh, I think right. showed up because I was moving. Yeah. It's one of those things where you're like, I didn't throw it out, but I don't know where it is. I have no idea where it is. Yeah. It's somewhere in here. I just don't know where it is. Hey, shout out to our patrons at the master and grandmaster levels, including DeGradia, A. Daniels, John and Becky Johnston, and Chris Smith. Yeah, uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, who's been popping in and checking out the new patron rewards. If you've never been a patron of DTNS, uh, you can get all kinds of cool things, including a commercial-free version of the RSS feed. If you're brand new, that that may be something that's worth checking out. Uh, but there's also other rewards like uh, access to our show docs, so you can you can check in and see the rundown as we're putting it together each day, or just page back through the tabs and look at all the stuff that we've done in the past. It's it's an easier way to find the show notes. Uh, so please uh, consider signing up patreon.com slash dtns our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com please send us email early and often we're also live monday through friday at 4 30 p.m eastern that's 20 30 utc and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow with patrick beja talk to you then this show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>